want to thank you all for coming on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. And um, what we will do is, uh, is have a combined presentation today for an update on the campus project as part of our continuing Sunday series of updates on the campus project. That's going to be very short, and we want to spend more time uh, providing uh, a briefing and a town hall discussion on the FY19 budget and capital improvements program. So that's what we're here for today. Again, thank you for coming, and uh, Mayor Tarter. I tell you, thank you. You stole my thunder, Wyatt. That's about I'm all sorry. I had to say. Um, I do want to welcome you all. Thank you for coming. Um, as, you, as Wyatt mentioned, this is a continuing effort. We've tried to be very transparent, very open about what we do in the city's finances and big capital projects like the school. Um, what you say, what your input is great interest in the school, the um, city council, the majority has pretty much every one of these meetings, the majority of city council is here today to hear what you have to say. Ross Lichten House in the back, Letty Hardy, Dave Snyder, and Phil Duncan. So uh, I also would like to just put in a plug. I think you all are probably aware we've got a women's march at 4 o'clock that's uh, leaving from what pretty much right outside of here? Right out front. So uh, that's a really great event, and I welcome you and ask that you all, if you're able to, uh, join in the march. Uh, Letty's one of the organizers, as is I'm very Beth Conley and know a lot of other folks. So. Uh, Anyway, thank you for coming out today. We welcome your input, your ideas. So, right. Thank you, Mayor Tarter. So, Dr. Noonan and I will just provide a, a very quick update on the campus project. And I would say at the beginning that this is a this is a time where we're both out to market with our solicitations. Uh, one for um, for bidders for the construction, design, and construction of the high school, and um, on the general government side inviting developers to come in and, and uh, provide provo proposals for the 10-acre uh, development uh, concept for the high school. Um, just uh, for basic orientation, I think everybody here in this room has participated in these meetings earlier, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but obviously this is the campus project. And conceptually, what we're talking about is new school construction for new uh, George Mason High School on the western portion of the campus and freeing up approximately 10 acres of land for economic development that will help pay for the project. Uh, the project which was approved by the voters um, in terms of issuing debt for the high school, $120 million in total debt authorization. And what we'll be talking about in the budget presentation is issuing approximately $10 million in debt this May uh, for the high school project. Then we'll go through uh, the design process and also the solicitation for economic development proposals and, um, and have an, an executed agreement for both prior to issuing uh, the construction bonds, the first issuance, which would be in, in uh, next spring in, in 2019. And so this will be factored into our budget discussion um, we'll talk about in just a moment. This is a schedule, and I think Dr. Noonan and I both can speak to this, just in terms of basic orientation of, of the schedule. Um, sort of going to the bottom line, we're trying to open a new high school in the summer of 2021. And so to get there, uh, we go through a, um, a process on the school side. I'll, I'll let Dr. Noonan speak to and In fact, maybe if you could just provide a quick update on that, um, and then I'll, I'll provide an update on the economic development. Sure, sure. Good afternoon, everybody. Whoa, it's really loud. Yeah. Uh, thank you all very much for being here and, and uh, being part of the presentation today. Uh, just a quick update for where we are in terms of this timeline. Um, we are in the uh, stage where February 2018, the issue of requests for detailed proposals. Um, we currently, as I think everybody here is aware, have down selected to three finalists that now will work on uh, between now and uh, the, towards the end of May what their conceptual design will look like. They will submit those and then from that, te those teams of three, uh, a team of those three teams, excuse me, we will then down select to a finalist. And that finalist will be selected in the June timeframe. Uh, and then school, uh, the school design um, will begin really in earnest. And that's where um, the, the team will come out, we'll hold community meetings, we'll talk about what the the design features can look like, um, et cetera. So that's kind of where we are, and I could actually do my update really quick so we can get that piece out of the way too. Um, since the last time we met, there hasn't been a whole lot that has happened with respect to um, the work on the campus site necessarily. There's been a lot of behind the scenes kinds of things that have been happening. 
um, around development of, a, of an overall map of utilities and the like. Um, but about a week and a half ago, we did have a meeting um, with those three uh, design build teams. We met at the high school, they came out. Um, I, it was very interesting to me, having done this a couple of times, to see how these meetings go, because you have these, this opportunity for the three design build companies to come sit in the same room together and ask questions. And it's a little bit like, um, not kabuki theater, but it's, 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 just, it's just interesting because nobody asks anybody any questions, because nobody wants to give away any of their <laughs> ideas. So we held this meeting, we sat there, we said, does anyone have any questions? And we fielded about two questions the whole time. And then they did a tour of the site. Um, but it was good to see those teams come together. I think they used it as an opportunity to kind of meet and discuss what was going on. So anyway, uh, between now and May, we will hold um, a couple of confidential meetings, um, not to share anything uh, beyond what was in the RFP, but to help guide uh, and answer questions that the teams may have, not guide, but answer questions that the teams may have. Um, and then in May, again, we will down select to a finalist and are, are very excited about moving in that direction. So the truth is there really hasn't been a whole lot since the last Sunday series, but we have had, have had that meeting. So I'll turn it back over to you. All right. Thank you, Peter. On the economic development uh, column, uh, the city, since our last get together, uh, the city has issued a request for conceptual proposals for, uh, to invite developers to come in with their ideas for the 10 acre site. Um, our intention is to down select, uh, they're, they're due in May, we'll down select in June, uh, similar to the process that, that is undergoing for the schools. Probably four top ranked proposals or thereabouts. Um, and they will then work through the summer for their detailed proposals and our goal is to select the top ranked development partner in October. Uh, then we'll work through uh, the winter months to finalize a land lease or land sale transaction agreement and finalize the entitlements for the property uh, which will be a very public process um, by the June 2019 time frame and the goal then is to issue the construction bonds after those two steps have been done. I feel like I feel like this line right here should be flashing yeah because this is the most critical point I think of both projects and the intersectionality of both coming together because we'll be at a place where we're ready to break ground yeah. and you'll be at a place where you'll where you will have finalized the land lease and the conceptual design so that's exciting yeah so keep that June 2019 date in your in your minds so we've got two very good processes that are happening concurrently with each other and we're coordinating together um, through the Campus Coordinating Committee. Our next meeting is next Friday morning at 7.30 in the morning. Um, and, and these two projects will just constantly uh, inform each other as, as they advance. Okay, so with that, we're going to shift over to the budget. And, um, and, and the two are very closely tied to each other. The, the CIP is, a, is the biggest driver in the, in the FY19 budget. And we, should, we can pause just uh, quickly for, for uh, questions on the campus project. Yes, Sharon. Well, I've been getting some questions from people. Yeah. Sorry, we surprised Cindy with that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, might, I surprised her. I'm not sure if I'm on. Okay. I've been getting questions from some people about the first um, tranche of the bond for the schools and the $10 million, and people want to know exactly what that's going to cover. Could you one of you explain that a little bit more and in a little more detail than we have? Sure. Sure, the, the major portion of that um, first $10 million draw is um, for architecture and engineering. Um, typically architecture and engineering costs about 7% of the entire project cost. So if you think about um, our overall cost of the project being 12, $120 million, we should have about um, 7% uh, of that as our, uh, our, our first go. Um, so, it's, so it's the architecture, the engineering, there's also project management funds that are in there. And there is um, some pre-work that may be able to be done prior to, um, and, and it'll be very small, some improvements to the land that can be done that we may need some cash flow to do. But beyond that, um, the majority of that $10 million first tranche is for the architecture, engineering, and project management. Any other questions on the campus project? And there will be the opportunity at the end 
uh, to have questions uh, on it as well as the budget. Yes. Uh, just hi. Uh, just a quick question. I'm impressed with the process that you guys put together, and I'm wondering if you modeled it after any other uh, school development project. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I'm. Um, I say that sort of tongue in cheek. Um, I, I, this is a new process uh, for me from the perspective of the interconnectedness between the city gen and general government and the schools. Even though I was in the city of Fairfax and we did a lot of building, there wasn't as much, I don't think, community input, community engagement, crossing of conversations with respect to the campus coordinating committee. Um, and then when I was in Fairfax County, there was zero conversation with the County Board of Supervisors. So I, I don't know um, how much you have done this kind of work in the past, but this is, a, a, for me, a new process, and, uh, and I think it seems to be working. So. We're adding so much value to the, uh, to, to the project management. Uh. Yeah, yeah, well, you're adding value to me every day, Wyatt. <laughs> <laughs> happy happy to, to do that. Okay, so we're going to shift to the budget now, and I've got about uh, 20 slides on the budget. I'm going to go through them briskly. Um, we did this presentation on Monday night uh, to the City Council. We're going to have a work session on the coming uh, Monday. But the goal here is to get information out and then get some questions back in and, and comments and questions. That's, that's really what we want to accomplish with this town hall meeting. So there are sort of three big areas of interest and in work in this year's budget. And um, obviously the operating budgets are always uh, a key part of, of budget development and vetting of the budget as it goes through the uh, governing body. Our capital investments and the annual debt service for those capital investments. That's the, the high school project, but as well as the city hall project and the library project. That is the big driver in all of our financial work and financial planning today. And then the wild card um, is WMATA Capital. Um, and we're working right now very hard to try to constrain those costs in terms of what the city exposure is for WMATA Capital. You're reading about it in the paper all the time. It's a big issue. But as in the budget, I felt obligated to put into the budget um, the, the assumption that we we're going to have to fund, uh, the, the, the city would have to fund WMATA Capital if we don't get the federal and state support that we're working very hard to get. So currently, in terms of, of, num of, of how it translates into the real estate tax rate, our operating budgets, uh, the council guidance was very, let's be very constrained and disciplined on our operating budgets. And in fact, with operate, operating budgets that have been presented, um, they alone would allow for a three cent reduction in the real estate tax rate. The capital improvements program, um, that would require a six cent increase in the tax rate. And that's really the number that we talked about last July with the adoption of the CIP and the numbers that we talked about in all of the town hall meetings, four cents for the high school, two more cents for the city hall and library projects um, as we went through the referendum process. And then WMATA Capital, that is the equivalent right now is built into the budget of two and a half cents on the tax rate. Now that number we think is going to change, it's going to get smaller, but we don't know yet all the dimensions of it. And I've got one more slide on it, but I'd, I'd like to invite uh, Council Member Snyder to speak to it as well. Um, I, and I'll just t touch on some of the big numbers, uh, but then we can drill in just a little bit on the WMATA numbers. But overall, with the general government operating budget, we would go to a $37.8 billion, uh, million <laughs> million dollar budget in FY19. <laughs> a $630,000 increase or a 1.7% increase. The school transfer uh, to 42.3 million, 1.1, million dollar increase or 2.8%. WMATA, 141% increase up to 2.3, or almost a total of five cents on the tax rate for WMATA, uh, but a two and a half cent increase that would be into FY19. So this is a big issue. We're putting a lot of work into it. I think a lot of actually very positive and constructive work, which is going to help make this get a little bit better in the coming weeks, I believe. But Councilmember Snyder. Thanks a lot, um, Wyatt. And just for the folks here, let me spend just two minutes on the WMATA funding situation. 
So we are hopeful that the number that Wyatt had to build into the budget will be reduced as we stand here today. We're hopeful. But there are th at least three clusters of things that can happen between now and when we really know what that number is. The first thing is the governor is going to make recommendations to the, to the General Assembly for, with potential changes with what they've already passed. Secondly, the General Assembly has to act on what the governor has amended. And third, it requires D.C. and Maryland to come forward with their pieces. As we sit here today, this looks like it's moving in the right direction, and we're, we're literally working 24-7. I want to point out city staff has been crunching numbers. We've been working at this for, for more than a year, and we continue to work on it. There are all kinds of meetings, phone calls, whatever else that that uh, you may not immediately uh, be aware of, but we're working really hard to drive that number down, but why it was right to put the worst case analysis in. So I just wanted to take a minute and assure people we're doing everything we can to drive those numbers down. At the same time, we realize Metro is critical to us and to our region, and coming up with a, an appropriate amount of capital is fundamental to keeping this general manager in place, who's made a huge difference, I think, in the operations of the system. Um, so that's where we are today. If, if anybody has any questions, please take them. Yes, real quick. Can you just give a little context as to where that number comes from? I know there's been a lot in the papers, but it's not always clear about how they're actually calculating what each jurisdiction is. Right. Well, there are formulas based upon uh, various long-standing factors, and Cindy can tell you more about those formulas. But we capped operational increases to 3% a year. So we've imposed some discipline on Metro from an operating standpoint, but they have a lot of catch up to do. So the estimate is we need $500 million roughly to catch Metro up. And so the issue is where are we going to get the money between the three state level um, jurisdictions? And then of course, in the case of Virginia, it's the localities, particularly the Northern Virginia localities, that are going to come up with a huge lion's share, virtually all of that money. Um, because in Richmond, the whole game is we take the money out of Northern Virginia, spread it around the rest of the state for education and public safety. When Northern Virginia wants something, it has to tax itself over and above. And that's just the political reality we're dealing with right now. Hopefully, at some point, it'll change. But uh, that's kind of uh, what it is. And Cindy can tell you more about how, what the formula is to divvy up the responsibility be between the different jurisdictions. Um, the key one that I'll just focus on is the capital, because that's where that 154 million new Virginia money is for capital. And so that's all of the five jurisdictions in Northern Virginia that fund WMATA under the compact. For the city of Falls Church is 0.9 of the percent of the entire budget. So it's a small amount to the whole WMATA budget, but of course to us locally it's a significant investment. Um, and WMATA is important for the region, but also to the state in terms of the economy. The operating is a little more complex, so I won't go into that because it's based on your ridership um, for the buses. And because we don't originate a lot of people here, we get a bit of credit for all the buses that drive through the city. And then we also have accounts for people who start at East or West Falls Church who originate from the city, but not that drive through. So um, it's proportional to the size of our population and ridership. So in terms of pennies on the tax rates, the same impact in Fairfax County or Arlington is actually slightly higher because of, you know, there's some, some parts of the formula we've worked to try to make, you know, helpful to the city. Um, so this is a big, it's a big issue. Um, so that's the state of play on it today. Then, of course, the, the other big, uh, and, and thank you all both for, for your, your work on this. Um, debt service, this is the, the, uh, the big driver of our budget. Uh, our debt service will be going from $6.4 million a year up to $9.6 million. Um, and, and so that's, that's the six cents on the tax rate is, is to fund that increase in debt service. We do have um, uh, the pension return on investment. Um, and this is something that the council approved in 2014 in order to produce a, a permanent uh, benefit for the taxpayers of the city and help us afford our capital uh, program and that's coming online in this year's budget as a positive this year as well. But overall the budget is growing 7.6 percent and so this is uh, you know with these sort of the major components uh, that's what's driving that. Uh, Council adopted budget guidance back in December 
And these are some of the key points that were in that budget guidance, and I'll, and I'll, I'll touch on a number of these points as we go through the presentation today. Uh, this is where the revenues come from. We're hi highly dependent on real estate tax revenues, and that's not unusual for any jurisdiction. This is kind of the same ratio that you would see in our surrounding jurisdictions. Um, of that, we have the commercial sector, which is that share of, of uh, property taxes. But then sales tax, meals tax, and business licenses, those are the ones uh, that we work very hard in our economic development shop to try to grow those numbers, and, uh, and they are growing. Um, in FY19 as a result of that work. You do see, you know, overall revenues are growing 7.6 percent. Um, and some of that is with, you know, healthy growth in meals taxes. Sales taxes are growing kind of modestly, but we increased them 11 percent last year and reflecting the Harris Teeter coming online and, and the other improvements in the retail um, environment here. Um, that 7.8 percent growth in real estate taxes that's with the five and a half cent increase in taxes and the tax rate built in to that number. So the uh, assessed value, the, the way that real estate revenues are generated is the growth in AV plus any changes to the tax rate. And so what's happening in terms of assessed value is overall a 3.4% growth. Built into those numbers is new construction and uh, about 36 million uh, value of new construction in the city in the past year that's now on the tax rolls. This is where uh, the city tax rate would be at the five and a half cent increase. That would be a, a tax rate of a dollar thirty eight point five. Um, and so, you know, in the in the northern Virginia area, would be higher than the counties, kind of in the middle of the pack of the smaller jurisdictions in the cities. What these ac extras are. Um, a lot of the counties don't charge, don't build into the tax rate solid waste pickup, whereas that's about uh, five, six cents on the tax rate. So we think it's, you know, for equity's sake, we try to, try to include that. Um, this is uh, something that's worth sort of looking at for just a moment. Um, and, and this is very much what we want to get public input on so people are aware <coughs> of what we're trying to fund in the, uh, on the, uh, in the, in the, in the budget. Uh, largely on the, on the capital side and what it will cost. So for the median home in the city, uh, we have a value of about $676,000 is the median home value in the city. So for every penny on the tax rate, it will cost that median homeowner $67. Um, home assessments, the, the, the median uh, home uh, assessment increase would be a result of $262 increase on the tax bill. Uh, the five and a half cent increase is $372, so it would be a total of $634. Um, so that's a very significant number. We're very respectful of that number. Um, and, and, um, and I think that's the reason why the council asked for constraint on the operating budgets, knowing that most of this is going for our capital program. So again, uh, the capital program is the equivalent of six cents on the tax rate. Our operating budgets would allow for a three cent reduction in the tax rate. WMATA is currently at two and a half cents. That, we think that number is going to change um, in that overall uh, revenue requirement uh, with AV growth, <coughs> pennies on the tax rate, and $634 of, of um, impact for the median homeowner. Um, we are bringing for a, a proposal for enhanced property tax relief for the elderly and disabled in the city. Uh, we'll be talking about that at the, uh, at the April 2nd work session. And we're working through sort of the, the, the policy that will be the most beneficial for taxpayers in the city. Uh, but currently, or what is proposed is about $327,000 as a line item in the budget uh, for property tax relief. This is where the money goes. Um, education is 45% of the budget. Um, and Dr. Noonan will talk about the education budget, the school budget, in just a moment. Uh, debt service for schools and debt service for general government, together about 10% of the budget. Traditionally, debt service has been between 6 and 8% of our budget. It's growing, and it will grow up to just under 15% once our capital improvements program is fully executed. These are the other slices of the pie as we go around the horn. 
Um, public safety is fire and police. That's 12% of the budget. Public works, 6% of the budget. Rec and parks, 5%. Human services, 3%. Community development and building permits, planning is 6%. <coughs> uh, in terms of positions over time, there are, there are no net new increases in the budget uh, for FY19. Uh, we've got about a 4% decrease in staffing levels today relative to where we were 15 years ago. So we've been, we've been trying to manage uh, the productivity of our workforce um, in an era where our population is growing. Over that same 15-year period, the population of the city has grown 30%. Um, and we have fewer employees today um, uh, than we did 15 years ago. Um, and so when we show this to our employees at our town hall meetings, you know, I think people... They, they feel that, and, um, and a lot of that is with technology and trying to be more productive, um, but our employees, I think, are working very hard and, um, and to provide excellent services. Um, a couple of key areas, and I'll just go through a, a few slides on some areas that you, I think, investments that we're making that you'll see on the street. Um, the council's budget guidance was, let's make investments in our commercial districts so they're vibrant and walkable. And let's also try to preserve the character of our neighborhoods with effective traffic calming. Uh, so some of our downtown investments, uh, we have some grant money that we'll be using to help with Park Avenue as that aspect of the downtown area, making it more walkable and more attractive. Uh, tree lighting will keep the 60K that um, is part of the hotel tax for uh, flower planters and tree lighting and things like that. Neighborhood traffic calming is funded uh, $200,000 using some NVTA money that may be impacted ultimately how the WMATA issue gets shaked out. But um, we do have money in the budget uh, for traffic calming. We also have gotten some grants that will start to be uh, implementing not in FY19 but in FY20, trying to make a difference on traffic calming in our neighborhoods. This is all generally driven by citizen petitions and, and sort of a grassroots uh, project, uh, program. Some of the things that were accomplished in the last year, uh, we did replace all of our voting equipment. Uh, we've had uh, stormwater projects have been completed. Traffic signal timing, uh, that was a, a project that got completed this year. Cherry Hill Park Playground, that's probably full right now on a beautiful day. And we did have uh, traffic calming projects on North Maple, Lincoln Avenue, and other parts of the city. Uh, the Van Buren Bridge, um, if you're in that part of the city, you know it's under construction. Uh, the South Washington Transit Plaza and undergrounding, the utility undergrounding work is underway right now. Um, we're in the design uh, phase for a Dorchester area sewer expansion um, to help with backflow issues when we have big floods in that part of the city. Uh, some intersection improvements, bike share uh, will be rolling out. Larry Graves turf field and Roosevelt and Roosevelt uh, pedestrian improvement. That's another one that you'll see is under construction. Um, projects that are underway, Mount Daniel Elementary School is, uh, is, is uh, well underway and uh, exciting to see. Big Chimneys Park is in, in design right now and the City Hall project obviously is underway as well. And the last folks will be moving out of City Hall including our suite on Friday uh, this week and then all of our operations will be at 400 North Washington for building permits and paying taxes and that type of thing. Uh, human services is at the Gage House. Um, uh, looking ahead in, in 2019 we do have money in the budget for the library construction phase, other uh, facility improvements, a lot of grant funded transportation projects. The city uh, with Cindy's leadership and our transportation uh, folks We've been very successful in getting um, state money deployed here in the City of Falls Church for transportation projects. And then the WMATA subsidy, which we've already discussed, that is in the CIP because it's a capital investment. Um, just a quick note on debt. Um, we currently have $46 million of debt outstanding. That's roughly split about 75-25 between schools and general government. And that ratio is going to stay roughly the same but our debt is going to grow significantly. And this is, this is the big issue uh, that we've been working through really for three plus years now on how to manage this effectively. And that's why the, the uh, George Mason High School project is so important and, and, um, and we're having these monthly town halls on it. But we'll go up to $213 million of total debt 
164 million invested in our schools and just under 50 invested in our general government facilities. In terms of what that means for annual debt service, this is where we are right now. So we're asking for a tax increase uh, to cover this increase in debt service. In the out years, however, our plan of finance is to use uh, the 10 acres uh, through both the transaction for the 10 acres of economic development on the campus plus future tax yield to effectively shave this peak of debt service um, so that the tax increase we're asking for this year for the capital program, if that economic development program works as planned, and it's got a lot of decisions and a lot of hard work to make that happen, but if it does go according to plan, then the tax rate increase we're asking for now for the CIP is the last one we will ask for for projects that are already approved. That's the six cents um, that we referenced earlier. And so that's the plan of finance. I recognize uh, Kieran Bawa, our CFO, who's been working very hard on this um, and, uh, and helping us with our financial planning for the, for the capital program. Uh, we are highly rated. We're AAA rated or AA plus by Moody's. And, um, and those are really the, the key reasons why. We do have um, healthy reserves and we have a record of very strong financial management in the city, excellent demographics in the city, and that's what's allowing us to even contemplate a, a, a CIP um, to accomplish these needs. So uh, just to wrap up then, these are the three big areas that we tried to cover in our, in our budget summary. Um, operating budgets, uh, pretty constrained, would allow for a reduction in the tax rate in of themselves. Uh, the six cents on the tax rate for the capital program, which is consistent with what, what we talked about over the summer. And then WMATA Capital, which we're working very hard right now to get that resolved in a way, uh, it'll probably be mid-April before we'll really know where we're going to land on that, um, and, and we're working hard on it. So those are the slides that, uh, that I have. We, we'll have a work session on Monday. Um, our first public hearing and the first reading on the, the tax rate ordinance is scheduled for Monday the 26th. A series of uh, public meetings all pointing to April 23rd, uh, which is the uh, last Monday in April. Uh, for final adoption of the budget and of course everything we're talking about is for the budget that would go into effect on July 1st. Um, so I will now... You got one more on there maybe. Whoops, we don't need that one. Okay. You have uh, one? So I'm going to uh, queue up Dr. Noonan's presentation and then we'll do Q&A. Thank right. you. Thank you Mr. Shields. Uh, good afternoon again everybody. I'd like to thank uh, Lawrence Webb, our school board chair who's here. Shannon Linton, who is here as well, and Shauna Russell, who is here, also representing the school board. We appreciate your attendance. Um, I, I really do have like 20 slides. That was, that was like 35 oh, slides. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <coughs> Overstating. <all> right. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I, I, first of all, I want to I wanna say thank you to the city manager for, um, for your slides. I thought they were very well presented. And I also appreciate you saying up front that the operating um, the operating budgets of both the general government and the schools have been constrained. Um, I, I go back to the second to last slide, or whichever one it was, that really showed that between the general government and the schools operating budgets, we would actually result in a three cent negative tax rate. Um, and I think that that's a pretty powerful statement to say uh, pu publicly. So um, I'm going to try to go through these also relatively quickly um, and hopefully be able to answer some questions. I think everybody has seen uh, most of what I'm going to present, but just again, as a reminder, these are our foundational uh, priorities that we've established in our school system. Obviously, we have a really great school system that's centered on teaching and learning, student-centered on teaching and learning, making sure that we have really great staff, making sure that we have great facilities and learning environments, and all of that's being taken care of as part of our capital project. And we're, again, we're very respectful of that, ensuring really strong fiscal and responsible uh, fiscal management and then making sure that we engage the community. And again, today I think really hits that. So if you think about those five, um, if, I, if I could go through and check them all, I think we're in a really good place with each of those. Um, our, t our big priorities as we headed into this 2019 school budget was to really align it um, to what our priorities were in the system. Um, we, we spent a lot of time this last summer working on what, what we call our triennial plan, which is essentially a three-year strategic plan that really lines out where we want to be over the next um, several years. 
And so this year, um, going into the budget process and working with our principals and working with our staff and working with our community, we said to everyone, before you just start making budget requests for things that you need, you must tie it to our strategic triennial plan. And all of your requests have to be in line with that. Um, and so this year, for the first time um, that I'm aware of in talking with some of our, our staff, um, we really spent time scrubbing each of our, uh, each of our uh, requests to ensure that there was strong alignment. And as we did that, we also wanted to make sure that everyone understood that was making um, a request for a budget item that we needed to show respect for the capital improvement uh, project that's going on. And again, that's the big high school project. And showing fiscal restraint because we know that the, the capital side is gonna be um, pretty significant. So just as a reminder to everybody, um, this is our big pie chart. It kind of shows a little bit about where um, our money goes in the school system. And we are a people-driven organization. Um, so 85% uh, of our entire school budget goes to people. And that salary and benefits combined, the rest is purchase services, some materials and supplies, capital outlay, and some transfer and reserves. Um, so when we, um, when we increase in numbers of students and we increase in people, that 85% goes up. When we, uh, when we look at reducing costs in the school system, really the place that we have to go to if we're going to reduce is that 85% and that means reducing people. Um, and I don't think that that's anything that we have an interest in doing right now because we have um, really great class sizes and we have really great people and our, and our system continues to grow. But I just wanna make sure that everybody understands that our budget is about 85% uh, salary and benefits. So enrollment drives our projection, our projections uh, drive our enrollment projections and our budgets going forward. And over the course of the last um, three years, we've had some up and down with respect to our overall enrollment. So if you look at 2016, we increased by 69 students. That was a, a pretty average um, number of students that come into the system. But in 2017, we increased by 136 students, which was a, a bit of an anomaly, um, all things considered. And then this last year, we had an overall growth of only eight students, which was also equally sort of confusing to us as we looked at the data. But when we go back and we look at the long-term growth of our, of our population, what we see is that the over average growth over the last three years is 71 students. And moving back several years, that's about what it is um, over the last 10 years or so. So we are anticipating not the average of 71, but really looking at a growth projection of about 63 students for next year. So as we begin to build our budget, one of the things that we need to think about is what, what can we do to support those 63 new students that we're anticipating. Um, this is our cost per pupil compared to other regional, it's a bit of an eye chart, and, and I have another one in here that's even harder to see, but I will share with you uh, that, that's how we pull things off around here. We just kind of <laughs> make it hard to see, and I'm just kidding. Um, but here is Falls Church, and um, Falls Church, in comparison to Arlington County, um, Alexandria City are sort of the top three in their cost per pupil. Our FY16 uh, cost per pupil was $18,000, uh, $18,000 again, and FY17, um, $18,400, and our FY2018 budget would be $18,219 dollars per student in comparison to about um, just over $19,000 in Arlington per student and uh, just over $17,000 in Alexandria. So it gives you a sense of kind of where we fall. The reason that our cost per pupil is up uh, as it is is because we have some values here that I outlined at the very beginning in terms of what we pay attention to in our system. And one of the things that we pay attention to is making sure that we have really small class sizes so that we know our kids and are able to build those relationships. And when we have smaller class sizes, the cost per pupil goes up. One of the things that I wanna also just sort of say in the context of this slide, because I think context matters, is that even when another, every time a student shows up, it doesn't mean that it's $18,000 more each time a student comes in. Uh, because there are economies of scale. So if we have a class that's 19, we can add a 20th to that class without adding another teacher. Just like when we go down in enrollment, if you take one away, it doesn't mean that our budget drops by $18,000 either. So I wanna make sure that there's not just an in and out, one for one, when it comes to um, per cost per student. Um, because unfortunately, students don't come in nice packages of 20 or 22. We can just plug them into a new class. 
Um, so that, our keys to success as we see them in the City of Falls Church um, is to attract the best and brightest that we can bring to the city. And we, so far, so good in the recruiting season, have done very well bringing in some early hires that are going to work for us teaching special education. We've been able to go to some recruiting fairs and are, are finding some success meeting some people there. Um, and, and that's been good uh, because we also talked to them about building capacity through our excellent work in professional development and helping our community, uh, our community grow. Uh, and then we want to retain them. And part of retention is making sure that people feel very confident and comfortable where they're working, that they feel valued, and they feel like they're part of a broader community. So if you think about sort of what makes us feel good and that efficacy piece, one of the things that we see in the efficacy of teachers is making sure that they really feel like they're valued and cared for in the community that they work. And I think overall we do a really good job with that here in the City of Falls Church. And then we want to remain regionally competitive. Um, and we want to make sure that our salaries are consistent with those that are in the surrounding jurisdictions and we don't fall behind. So Terry McAuliffe um, has done, recently done a study, or commissioned a study, he didn't actually do the study himself, but he commissioned a study to really look at a teacher short, our teacher shortage issue in Virginia. So the University of Virginia recently did a study, and one of the things that we know is that there's a national crisis, but we are not immune in Virginia to this national crisis. And so I just want to put that on your radar, that um, when you hear about national teacher shortages, it's very easy to think, well, in our schools here in the City of Falls Church, we have five or six or seven people that are competing for the same position. And unfortunately, that's the way it was maybe 10 years ago, but we're not seeing that now. And one example of it is that our universities in Virginia um, graduated in single digit numbers um, uh, science teachers for upper level science. So they graduated between five and 10 total science teachers for the entire state of Virginia. Um, to teach physics and advanced chemistries and the like. And across the Commonwealth of Virginia, we have over 200 vacancies for physics and for chemistry and the like. So we are really seeing, unfortunately, um, the, the negative impacts of the, the national teacher shortage, even in the state of Virginia. So I want to kind of keep that also out there as something to think about as we think about how we uh, are working with our teachers. So um, the first thing that we are really looking at, and it's sort of the centerpiece of what we're trying to accomplish here, is we're requesting first an increase of 2.8%. And that 2.8% would then provide for us a 3% cost of living adjustment for our teachers here in the City of Falls Church. Uh, and, and by the way, it's not just our teachers, it's everyone in the system. So our bus drivers would get a 3% COLA, our cafeteria workers, our custodians, our teachers, our paras, everyone affiliated with the system. Um, would get a 3% cost of living adjustment. In addition to that, um, the reason that we need the 3% uh, or the 2.8% is first to cover the 3% COLA and the second is to be able to hire a psycholo psychologist. Um, right now, our school psychologist numbers are completely out of whack. Right now, we have one school psychologist for every 1,339 students. And that is um, disheartening and discouraging particularly given the needs of the students that we're seeing each and every day that are coming in. So the 2.8% transfer uh, for us, that, that would equate to $1,171,046. The 3% cost of living adjustment, for us to be able to give a 3% cost of living to all of our employees would, would cost $1,059,546 and to hire a psychologist would be 103300 That would mean that that would leave us $8,200 in the school system to do everything else that we need to do. Um, and, and we have a plan for that, and I'll talk about it in just a second. But I want to make sure that everybody understands that that 2.8% really just covers the cost of the COLA and it covers the cost of a psychologist for us. Um, so there are other initiatives that we have in our triennial plan. Um, that need to be funded, and those have been funded through some realignment and some readjustment of our current budgets, and we've also taken some reductions and found some savings to be able to do some of that work. So again, the centerpiece of our budget is the 3% uh, cost of living adjustment. It really speaks to human capital being the driver of who we are and what we do best. Um, these are the people that work with our students every single day. Um, the proposed COLA um, also, again, would benefit all of our, our, all of our employees. Um, and it would help us become and continue to become competitive in the region. Right now, just uh, by um, uh, 
comparison, Fairfax County is propo proposing an average teacher salary of 5.5%. Um, and then there is a range in the region of between 2.5% and there are some systems that are going up to 7.6% in compensation. So our 3% cost of living adjustment that we're requesting the 2.8% transfer for is really the bottom of the edge of, of the uh, regional comparisons in terms of salary increases. Um, Arlington is proposing a step increase and even after us giving a 3% cost of living adjustment, we would continue to be behind Arlington County in their salary. And I know that that's something that's been a focus area for the schools for several years. Um, and so with the 3% COLA, we would get to within 1.3%. Without the COLA, we would still be behind Arlington by over 4% in our salary. So in order for us to gain ground, because they're only giving a step and we would be giving a COLA, so it would raise our salary structure, um, that COLA would get us to within the 1.3% gap. Um, th this is just a chart that sort of shows what everybody's doing um, regionally. So we've got Arlington, Alexandria, Fairfax, Loudoun, Manassas, Manassas Park, and Prince William. We have the handouts and you can take them with you when you leave so you can have this chart with you. Um, and this is the other eye chart I was telling you about. You won't be able to read, but I think it's important to note. Um, everywhere you see red, red is bad. Red means that we're behind, okay? Um, so what, what that means is if we were to give a 3% cost of living and we compared it to Arlington, for the first three years of our employees, our employees here in the City of Falls Church actually would be paid more than in Arlington for the first three years. But after those three years, when people start making decisions, do I want to stay in teaching? Do I want to leave teaching? Um, is this the right profession for me? that's when we start to lose ground. So the first three years, good, and then everything after that is not so good. Um, and that's if we give the 3% COLA. If we don't give the 3% COLA, it's red everywhere. So um, I wanted to share that with you as well. And those are, these also are in there. And this is, okay, so this is the gap with the 3% COLA. So it's still good for the first year, but every, every year after that first year, we would continue to fall behind um, our, our closest neighbor. So the schools and departments were really asked in the school system to submit only requests that they really needed to have that were connected directly with our triennial plan. Um, and using that criteria that I described earlier, we had 16.9 positions that were requested um, that e equaled more than $2 million. Now, we all know in this room that that's an impossibility given the current fiscal circumstances that we're in. So we took a really hard look um, as leaders and we called in the principals and we called in our CTLs, our collaborative team leaders. We talked to the staff in central office and the like. We talked with the school board. And what we were able to determine was that we could fund through our current process with the 2.8% transfer about a third of the total requests that were, were requested. Um, and we could fund some of those through realignments and re, re, uh, reductions. So here's where uh, we landed. These are positions that we are taking care of by, scrubbing, by the scrubbing of our budget that we've been able to do to find cost reductions, find efficiencies, um, to find uh, some, recapture some savings that were there and the like. So we, we need some clerical support at Jesse Thackeray LM, uh, Preschool and we were able to fund that through some of our uh, reductions. We need a PYP coordinator at our two elementary schools. Right now our middle and our high school have IB coordinators, uh, the PYP program is the primary years program. That's when our students are getting their start in uh, the IB program and our elementary schools do not have a person. So we are, so that would fund a half-time person at Thomas Jefferson and a half-time person at Mount Daniel. The assumption is that it would be the same person. So it'd be one person that would work between the two schools and then we would spend some money on a laptop cart at the elementary school. And that's just the cart, it's not the, the computers itself, it's just the rolling cart to get the computers around. At the middle school, we need a school counselor, a half-time school counselor. We've been able to find through some reductions, um, a, a part-time money to purchase a part-time counselor at the middle school, and also a math specialist. Um, this counselor piece is another kind of like the school psychologist. You know, we have middle school kids that are struggling. They need another person to reach out to, to build a relationship with. And so that middle school counselor would do that. At the high school, we would fund some career and technical education um, materials and supplies. Um, we would look at our hybrid, our high C program needs some materials and supplies. 
and then we built in a $5,000 amount to do some band replacement for instruments. Uh, right now we don't spend anything on band instruments for replacement and I think that we need to start doing that um, to start building our programs. Um, and then system-wide, we did add one special education teacher, a special education specialist. We're repurposing an, ES an ESOL teacher. That's the LEAP specialist. Um, so right now, what we're seeing is that our numbers in ESOL are going down uh, compared to 10 years ago. So we can take one of those positions that's there, repurpose it, and make it a division person that really supports all of our teachers across the division in working with our ESOL students, who are most, um, some of our most at-risk students. Um, looking at some materials, uh, looking at software licenses, bus driver, supervisor, additional time, um, and some bus replacement money is in there as well. Um, and all of these, which are aligned to our triennial plan, have been taken care of through reallocation and realignment. So the 2.8% the transfer that we're requesting would not pay for any of this. We've done this internally and shuffled th some things around to find efficiencies. So when we got the budget guidance before from the City Council that Wyatt, uh, Mr. Shields sh uh, showed earlier, the first was to maintain excellent service in schools. <coughs> and when we put together our budget request, we say check, it does that. It puts together um, a really great program for our schools, it supports our teachers and our students. It did not cover the 2% operating guidance that was given. Um, and we, we understand that uh, and we, we tried very hard to be respectful of that um, but when we look at the needs of the school, we just weren't able to do it with 2%. The two, a 2% operating growth cap wouldn't even give us enough money to cover the cost of a cost of living allowance for our teachers. So that was an important piece for us to, to look at. But there were other pieces to this as well. We, did we comply with the fiscal policies internally? Absolutely. Did we find efficiencies? For sure. We really scrubbed our budget hard and were able to pay for all of those other things by reallocation and by finding some of those efficiencies. Are we competitive in our employee compensation? This 3% would allow us to remain competitive in employee compensation. And then the other three, we think we have influence on, but not direct in influence on. We think that we're an important component in the schools to having a vibrant business district. We think that people move here for a reason, and they move here because of the schools. And if we can create a good school system, a great school system, people are gonna wanna come be part of our vibrant district, um, business district. Um, we don't have anything to do with traffic calming, so, um, except our school buses go slow. Um, and then WMATA, uh, unfortunately, we don't have anything to do with either. So again, a 2% guidance leaves us a gap, would leave us a gap of $350,236 from the proposed budget. That would mean reducing the cost potentially to uh, the COLA to 2.3%. It could result in elimination of four teaching positions or it could mean that we wouldn't fund some of those other things that we found some efficiencies to do with the exception of uh, the psychologist, but we might not be able to fund the psychologist, a special ed teacher, the clerical support, the PYP coordinator, or some band instruments. So with the local funding providing 83.7% of our schools, and, and we understand that, we are a big nut in this city and, and we respect that. Um, we, we are respectfully asking that as this budget process continues that we work to get us the 2.8% so that we can meet the needs supporting our employees, address the mental health issues associated with our students <coughs> and their wellness as well. Um, <coughs> with respect to fiscal stewardship that we've talked about a little bit, this is the last, um, this is the funding history going back to FY10. And you'll recall this is sort of the end of the recession. So it was a negative 1.5% 1. 1. and a negative 4.9%. In FY12, it was 0% transfer to the schools. But in 13 and 14, <coughs> 9%, 12%, 9%, 4%, 3.4%, and this year, FY19, when our revenues are looking really good in the city, we're coming in at 2.9%. So we really feel like in the abstract here, We've been very thoughtful about what we're doing. Um, our overall budget increase from year to year, just to give you a sense also of what we, what we see, is that when you account for the 3% COLA, you account for the triennial plan alignment and priorities, um, our operating budget actually is only increasing by 0.8%. We still need the 2.8% to cover our budget, but our overall budget has decreased um, because of some other big costs that weren't uh, coming into play for this year. 
So for example, uh, we bought some buses last year. We don't have to buy buses this year. We bought some technology equipment last year. We don't have to buy this year. So some big costs came out. So our overall budget has actually reduced um, significantly. So kind of um, ending closely uh, to where um, the city manager did as well, um, the 2.8% increase, just to summarize, would allow us to get a 3% COLA and fund a psychologist. <coughs> Everything else we would take care of because $8,200 doesn't get us the half-time counselor, doesn't get us the school materials, doesn't get us um, a special ed teacher and the like. So we'll take care of that part if, if the general government can help us take care of the cost of living and the school psychologist. Um, this, is, this is sort of where I think it all hits <coughs> for me is when we look at the city manager's budget and the school's budget, um, we actually, when you put those together, result in a three cent reduction in the tax rate. So really the tax rate is to cover the debt service for the high school. We understand and we respect that, but also to take care of um, city hall and take care of the library. Um, that's three cents. So if you were to control for city hall and to control for the library, I would submit to you that the high we would be getting the high school for about two cents out of that three cents, which is significantly less than we thought we were going to get it for. The wild card here is WMATA. Unfortunately, WMATA is coming in at 2.5 uh, pennies on the tax rate, which takes us to 5.5%. So we've reduced the budget, um, and, and that is, uh, that's something we're trying to pay close attention to. So um, with that, I appreciate your time. Uh, it was 23 slides, sorry about that. Um, but uh, we, I know that the city manager and I would welcome your questions, your comments, your thoughts, concerns. Um, all of the above. So. so at this point, then, I uh, would like to turn it over to you for your questions and comments. And um, we do have a microphone. And the purpose of that, of course, is we're taping this. So we will rebroadcast re re this town hall meeting on our local uh, TV station. And Genevieve Lamas is behind the, the uh, door here. Uh, Genevieve, thank you for being here. There she is. <laughs> the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. That's right. It is a woman because it's the Women's March coming up. Yep, no ads. No ads. Mr. Shields, uh, what percentage of the budget is the school as a Trans the transfer represents 40... 45% of the overall total budget. And that's been basically consistent with uh, what our, we've done in the past, correct? It is. Okay. Yeah. Um, have we ever discussed, I know we discussed it, never got anywhere on the revenue sharing aspect <laughs> of the budget, and that would save the superintendent from having to come up here and dance for... <laughs> every town hall meeting because we would just give you X percent and you wouldn't have to why don't we wouldn't care where you spend it this is what you get um, we want to be like Arlington that's exactly what Arlington does um, they give it they're, they're on a revenue sharing personally I would feel that that would um, help the schools and the teachers to become part of the community they have an investment in supporting the community, shopping within the community, which we see we're closing one of our local favorite restaurant, uh, grocery stores today. The local market is spending their last day today. Um, we need to be able to shop local, um, work local, local, and live locally as well with some affordable housing, which we are sorely behind on um, most most people who work in the city can't afford to live in the city um, the other question um, I'll think of it but I'll give it to someone else now thank you mr. Laporta I will, on revenue sharing I think uh, I think it's a discussion that mm -hmm. uh, we might be having in the in the coming weeks. Um, it would probably really be an FY20 and beyond uh, discussion. So over the summer months, when, um, after this budget is adopted, I think it'd be a good good thing to discuss. I know that uh, I I won't speak for 
the entire school board because they haven't taken a, an official position on it, but I do know that the, there are several members of the school board that are interested also in looking at a revenue sharing um, possibility as well. And I, I think it'd be, uh, it'd be very nice if we could get there. It really helps for multi-year planning, and, um, and that's very valuable uh, when you're thinking about where you're trying to get to strategically, um, having, having that could be very helpful. Dr. Noonan, can I just ask a clarifying question? You referenced early on small class sizes, and I know they vary widely across the system. My kids are at TJ, their class sizes, you know, it's debatable whether people think they're small or not. I'm curious what you think the ideal would be through the system for class sizes, if so, we could get there. It's a really great question, um, and not an easy one to, to answer. Um, and, and I'll start with it. In many ways, for me, it comes down to the quality of the teacher as opposed to the size of the class. <clears throat> so, so I would much rather have a really great teacher with 27 students than a really bad one with five. Um, so I, I think it's a really a, a, an important both and. Um, so I, I think that the state, um, throwing sort of the, put it, putting the state aside, um, I think keeping them small, um, in, particularly in primary years, is really important so that we can build relationships. I'm gonna dodge a number. I'm just gonna tell you that right now. Um, because I think it's really hard to, to say exactly what the right number is, um, but I, I do think that 20 to, to 25 is probably a good range for um, elementary, middle, and, and high. Um, I think some classes could be potentially larger to find some efficiencies, um, particularly at the high school. Um, but I wouldn't want to lose. Here, here's, here's one of the pieces of feedback that I got from our teachers when I was talking to them. Um, and Farrell Kelly, who is the, the head of FCCEA, um, the Teachers Association, is the one who said it. Um, the one thing we don't want to do is lose uh, what makes us great here in the city of Falls Church. And one of the things that makes us great, and I, I've seen it too, is the relationships that we're able to build with families and with students. And when you get into a place that's staffing, for example, um, in Fairfax County, they're staffing uh, high school classes at 29 to one. Um, and, and if you have seven classes of, or five classes with 29 kids, you, you have no opportunity to build a relationship. So I really wanna try as best we can to keep those numbers down so that we can really build those relationships. So I, I think any more than 25 becomes unwieldy, um, particularly, not from a classroom management perspective because we have really great kids, um, but from a, an instructional perspective and how do you flex kids um, uh, and how do you differentiate to meet the variety of needs that each student has in the classroom as well because not, it's not a one size fits all for everyone. So being able to differentiate instruction is important too with small, smaller classes. <coughs> I respect a lot. Can you hear this? Mm -hmm. I, oh, okay. I, I can hear you. It's coming okay, out the mic. Uh, uh, I respect a lot of what you're interested in um, procuring for the schools. And uh, I think, as we often do, we have quite a conundrum because we all do and we all want a lot of things for the city and at the same time we need to uh, be more creative about revenue. Uh, and I'm one of the supporters here among uh, a group of people for more affordable housing. But I'm wondering, and this is really just posing an idea because I don't know all the details, uh, I think that a school psychologist is imperative, but I wonder if you could explore a psychologist through some sort of partnership whereby it's not paid directly through the schools but still enables kids to go to a psychologist without telling their parents that might be able to be, I, I, I know they couldn't then bill insurance but I just wonder if there's a way to do that rather than hiring somebody full time. Thank you for that idea. You know, we, we continually are looking for creative options um, like that. I, I worked in a school system and was a principal of a school that had a community health component to it where the psychologists would come into the school, would work with our kids and then, and then move out but didn't work directly with the school. Um, it's certainly something we can explore. The, the harder part for a school psychologist is not just the day-to-day -day interactions with kids but they're also doing educational testing with students as well. Um, and so when you have someone who's, for example, a licensed psychologist, a clinical psychologist, they can't do all of that educational testing that school psychologists do as well, but that, but that shouldn't inhibit us from looking at options. So we, we certainly are exploring all, all avenues, that's for sure. So thanks for bringing that up. Thank you. 
This is for uh, Dr. Noonan. Hi, Dr. Noonan. Um, as you know, the PTA gives out money in grants, um, and we each cycle we give out $5,000. We will give out approximately $15,000 to $20,000 this year in teacher grants. Uh, this last cycle, we had $5,000 budgeted, and we had $8,000 worth of grant requests. Um, what I've known um, in my involvement with the PTA, what I've noticed over the past couple years is that, you know, the reason we put these grants into being is we wanted to give teachers an opportunity to try creative curriculum um, programs, things that they had never tried before, pie in the sky types of things. And what I've noticed over the past couple years, these grants are tending to be more and more professional development equipment and supplies, which I think most people would say should be covered in the budget. So what's, uh, what's sad for us is that it, you know, our grants, what used to be, this is something fun that you can try with the, with the students, something, a different way to approach learning. Now it's becoming very much, look, I need, I want to go to a math conference. I can't afford to go the $500 registration fee and there's no money in the budget. Um, we just gave a grant for a, literally a springboard for the gymnastics unit at PE, at TJ for their gymnastics unit, you know, that we're buying equipment like that. So I guess I, what I want to know is, you know, you said two thirds of the requests weren't even covered in this budget. Could you talk a little bit about what's, what isn't even covered in this request? Yeah, thank you. And, and thank you, Ms. Downs, for your incredible support of the schools financially and otherwise. Um, without, it's really interesting, without you know, the, the PTA support and the Ed Foundation support and other agencies that come in to help support our schools, um, I'm not sure we would be able to do all the great things that we're able to do. Um, I, I would s suggest that that list of $2 million worth of things included everything from people um, because there were some principals that said they wished that they had another person to, um, to reduce class size to, in some areas, um, to professional development, um, some things going to conferences, for example, um, and there were also materials in there. And, and I think your point is a good one, and that is um, should, should outside private entities be paying for um, items that I think the school system should be responsible for, sort of a public good, right, is to, to pay for a springboard for <laughs> PE. Um, but there were, there were some things in there, for, even for PE, um, just to, as a point of order. But we could, um, we could actually put, I think that list is online, um, so we could certainly publish sort of all of those requests that were out there that weren't met as well. Peter, thank you for that. Um, detailed presentation. I think it puts a lot in light. My daughter's long out of my high school and I'm not in the nitty gritty of um, the operations of the school and what happens with budgets and that sort of thing. But I can say one thing. Um, our city schools are literally our flagship product. I move people in and out of the city, more in the city than not, and they come. They come for the schools. And if there's any way to fund, fully fund our school budget, I think we really seriously need to consider that. Um, it, it, um, in the draw of bringing people, moving people into the city, it's because of the quality of the schools. The word on the street is Falls Church City Schools are the best, one of the best, if not the best in the area. And um, it's just ever so important to you know, keep, keep the funding where it needs to be. I mean, people come to Falls Church City probably for other things. Not so sure the dining experiences are what draw people here, but you know, it really, it truly is the schools and I can't say enough about um, the support that's needed for them. A uh, question for Mr. Shields. Uh, oh, I think I read some pl place where Arlington on this current budget cycle is uh, raising their utility tax to the maximum that they're allowed to, I believe, under state law. Have we maxed out our utility tax? Um, I will need to look into that. I don't know precisely the answer to that question. Do you know, Ms. Paula? So uh, we'll, we'll look into that and, and get back. The only change in any fee or tax that is proposed in this budget is the change of the real estate tax. Um, this is a point of information, but yeah. Thank you. Hi, um, I came a little bit late, so I'm sorry if you talked about this earlier in the presentation, but can you talk about what opportunities uh, you're exploring for cost sharing between the city and the school to reduce budget needs, operating budgets? The, um, this is a, 
issue of long-standing interest and discussion. And there are a lot of things that the city does together. We uh, manage our fleet together. Uh, we take care of a lot of our landscaping. Uh, we do a lot of our contracting together. Um, but there are some other areas that, that um, I think are subject to further study. And they've been looked at in the past, but they haven't been looked at probably in the last four years or so. And so I think that's something that uh, Dr. Noonan and I are committed to making sure we've thought all the way through. Uh, some of them are pretty complex about how you might um, consolidate or merge them. So some of them probably need a little bit more at thought than probably could be just accomplished in the next couple weeks in the budget. Um, I think probably both of us have the view that with consolidations and mergers, probably what you're talking about is providing a richer service level or a, a, a better service level. A lot of these are internal functions also, like HR, finance, and type of thing. You provide a, a higher level of service, possibly for the same cost. Um, it's unlikely, when we've looked at this in the past, that there's big savings there. Now, purchasing for department, department as an example, is, is one person. Accounts payable, it's one person. Um, so these aren't huge departments where, you know, you might be able to not fill some vacancies or something like that to save some money, um, but you might be able to provide um, better services through, through uh, working together. That's my thoughts on it. I, I would echo uh, Mr. Shields' thoughts on it as well. Um, it has been a subject of conversation um, between both of us, and we'll continue. Hello, I'm Joan Curry. I recently moved to Falls Church. My husband and I did, um, not for the school system, but because we're retirees. And I will say that's one of the reasons people are moving to Falls Church, um, retired. Um, but I did want to point out a recent analysis about the proposed uh, uh, increase in the tax rate of 4.1%. That's higher. Okay, it is, let's get to the, to the statistics. It is about 40% higher than Arlington's rate. It's about 20% higher than Fairfax County's. It's about 30% uh, rate higher than a uh, Fairfax City's proposed rate, um, and it is about 23% higher than Alexandria's rate. Um, if you take that into consideration as well as the proposed tax rate increase, the, the assessment increase of 4.1%, um, these are, you know, repercussions, monetary repercussions for all of us, especially if we're planning on moving into Falls Church. Um, and um, the, there's also a, um, of course, the tax bill overhaul um, of the recent tax bill overhaul in Congress limits deduction of state and local income taxes to 10000 So I, I just want to point this out, that it's a consideration, especially for retirees. Um, and I don't know what, <laughs> what you're proposing over the longer term for what you see might be possible rate inc more in rate increases. Thank you. Well, I appreciate the comment. And it, it is a, it's a, I think the reason we have such a public budget process is because our tax rates impact everybody. And, um, and so we need to have these opportunities for people to speak about them and weigh in on them. And I think the city council is very, concerned about the term, you know, the long-term competitiveness of our tax rate. And I think that is behind what their guidance was in terms of keeping the operating budgets disciplined, knowing that the, the capital program is, is ambitious and, um, and will be expensive. Um, but, uh, you know, I, th I think that comment is one that needs to be heard every year in the budget process and is very much on our minds. My second question came back. Um, <laughs> you had a slide with the pie chart of revenues in the city. Yes. Um, I just happen to have Arlington's, uh, my little helper here. Their real estate percentage revenue is 57% from real estate. And they break it down thusly. Residential real estate, 26%. Commercial real estate, 19%. Real estate apartments, 14%. Uh, 
Okay, and I believe uh, they have meals taxes at four percent. I think you had another slide that broke them out by percentages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, oops. Too slow, Gary. Um, B poll at six percent. Um, just you know, comments that we need to find ways to increase our commercial. And I know I'm not going to be very popular, but uh, Arlington has, last I checked, at least 10, dev 10 buildings that were over 300 feet tall. Um, and I'm not saying we're going to go to 300 feet, but six stories is kind of pitiful. Uh, if we want the kind of developers we want to come in, we've got to go higher so that they can make money and we can make money at the same time. Because every floor that you go up <coughs> is more revenue for the city. And we've already proven several times that properly developed high-rise apartments and or condos uh, can give us a net net. So I think we need to really develop the commercial areas we have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just one note on, so we often look at what percentage of our tax base is in commercial uses. And, and for the City Falls Church, it's 20%. And uh, for Arlington County, 30% of their real estate tax base is in commercial uses. Uh, for us, about 10% are apartments in Arlington County. Uh, it's about 20% are apartments. Um, you know, so the difference on the commercial side, our 20% of our tax base in commercial uses versus their 30%, um, that's a one third, you know, that's their 50% more, uh, the difference between 20% and 30% um, in commercial uses. And that is a big help on their tax rate because every bit of that that's in commercial uses is also paying utility taxes, meals taxes, uh, beep pole taxes, and, um, and so that's really important. Um, we're trying to grow it. Um, it's, uh, you know, we, we are pushing very hard. And um, so I think uh, more to come on that. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brenda Heffernan, and I am a member of the Falls Church City Housing Commission. Um, so as a commissioner, needless to say, I was fairly dismayed to see that um, in the proposed budget, the line item for housing affordability is listed as an unfunded priority. So my question is, um, with zero dollars being allocated toward affordable housing, how does the city reconcile that with its long-term vision, which has prioritized um, addressing the affordability needs of our lower income citizens and residents? and uh, there was a mention of uh, property tax relief for seniors, which I think is a great start, but it doesn't address housing affordability for lower income families, first time home buyers who are often strapped with student loan debts, and even our teachers who, um, even with the COLA that's being proposed in the school board budget, can't afford to live in Falls Church City. And I just feel like if this is truly an inclusive community, which we all go around saying it is, it has to be affordable to, to everyone. Thank you for your service on the Housing Commission. Uh, affordable housing is a, is a big problem. Uh, it's a growing problem. Uh, 15 years ago, we identified it as a big problem, and it is significantly um, bigger problem today. In terms of all of the metrics of affordability, they are worse today than they were uh, 15 years ago. And um, in terms of money in the budget for it, um, the city does have a line item for, um, for like emergency rental assistance and things like that, but we have never had a dedicated source of revenue for affordable housing in the city. The way we have uh, attempted to address affordable housing has been through the proffer process, uh, working with new development to, to have a share of that for affordable housing. Um, so that's a, you know, the city council has laid that out in their council work plan and the Housing Commission and Housing staff are going to be updating our affordable housing policy in the coming months. Um, what this budget is premised on is that let's do that work, let's do that strategic planning, and then from that, 
uh, there may be budget implications that will then need to fold into, into future budgets. That, that's what's in the budget, but the City Council, I think, is going to have a lot of discussion about this over the coming weeks. Mr. Adobo. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Julio Cesar Hidrovo. I'm um, the chair of the Housing Commission here in the city. I just wanted to reaffirm what just Brenda said, but I wanted to, to say something in addition to what Wyatt just said. Um, what we have done in housing is not working. And it's not working because we are not putting real attention to what's happening with affordability in the city. I'm glad that we have a, a one person participating here that is not only coming here to the city for the uh, school system. We come here because we want to live in the city that is closed for, every, for everyone. And it's close, it location is pretty good. <laughs> and, but we have to recognize that we have different people in the city, different budgets, and only the ones with the higher budgets, highest, higher income, can afford to live here. We need to address that. And, and I find this surprising. A month ago, we sat down with boards and commissions our city council envisioning the city. And I'd um, relate that to like sitting down with your parents in the kitchen table and just doing the exercise of, uh, okay, what's going on? What's gonna happen in the future? What we can fix? Mm -hmm what we need to fix, and what problems we, de we need to address in the future, the next year. And then you find out that one of the problems is, okay, is the hidden uh, condition that we have in the house. We need to put some money in it, right? Then in the next meeting, you find out like this one, that your parents did nothing to put money to fix that problem. So guess what? That problem is going to get worse if you don't put some money, if you don't put attention to those problems. And I have to bring your attention about something. Affordability is not housing the poor. You have to get rid of that, that particular uh, uh, thinking. Affordable housing means a lot of things completely different. The, that means different programs, different money for different groups. Money for the people who are aging at the houses and they cannot afford to pay those taxes. People who want to come here because they want to get a more diverse uh, city. We are losing diversity. That was one of the problems that we have in the past. So we have to address that. Now, let's check it out some number, numbers. We have a project, you know the fields up there in uh, uh, Route 7 in um, Taco Bell, Bell, behind Taco Bell. We have 96 units that in the next six years, are, they are gonna lose the tax credit. That is around $2 million that they will need, they will need to survive as affordable housing project. How much money are we putting in that project to save it? Two million dollars is a lot of money in our 90 million dollars budget. So we need to put some money in it, at least something, to save that project if we want to save it. We need some money for people who want to buy here and some uh, programs for uh, rental assistance we need some money for um, uh, closing assistance for programs for first-time home buyers, programs for uh, um, the ones who want to live here and not pay more than 30% of their income. But we need to do something. I really want to call the attention of everyone here that if we don't solve that problem today, we're gonna have a worse situation in the future and not doing nothing right, right, right now is not going to fix the problem. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julio. Yep. Hi, my name is Ellen Salisbury, and in the 90s, I served two terms on the Housing Commission, and I'd like to say that the problems we had in the 90s have not been 
erased. The problems are still with us. But one thing I'm curious about is when a new development comes online, does the city have guidelines as to what percentage of the units in that residential development, either rental or a condo, must be affordable housing? Yeah, the, uh, the policy is between 6 and 12 percent of the units. Excuse me? Uh, between 6 and 12 percent of the units. And uh, we have traditionally been getting 6 percent. Uh, we, we recently did a comparison uh, with other jurisdictions. And, you know, for the types of projects that get built in the city of Falls Church, that actually, the number of units that we get is actually more than what Arlington County would get, say, for the, a Broadway or for a Pearson Square, for the types of projects that, that get built here. So uh, the negotiations, I don't think, are out of whack with what's happening in the region. But I think in, from a policy perspective, I think there is a discussion. We've always said we want units. We're not interested in cash. Um, but if there, are, if there are better ways to use cash, which I think could come through this affordable housing policy strategy, then we might shift that. And usually you can get more cash than you can for units because the developers, that's easier for them. So th I think there's discussions and there's some, we have to kind of go through our priorities and go through our strategies and then have our funding decisions follow that. And I think that's what's going to be having, happening over the, over the next few months uh, with, with the leadership of the Housing Commission um, uh, and their work on this. Uh, Hi, I'm Lindy Hockenberry. I'm also on the Housing Commission uh, liaison from the Planning Commission. Uh, the other pro problem with uh, the uh, the units that we get, unfortunately, they're based on AMI, average median income, and even with 100%, they're not affordable. And uh, so we've been trying to get it more down to 40, 60%. So there are a lot of needs, and I'll speak on the side of senior citizens. You know, you might lose a very, very long, strong member of this community because it's getting more and more difficult. So I do think we need to address this across the board. So anyway, thanks Julio and everybody for bringing this up because I think it's a very serious program uh, problem and I'm very interested in keeping our diversity. I'm very proud of our diversity. Thank you, Lindy. I have a question about revenue because it seems to me that none of this stuff can be solved if we don't up the revenue and there was some chart you had way back about revenue shaving, or not shaving, but like new revenue coming in that was going to reduce or the need to increase tax rates higher at some point. Uh, and my question for you is twofold. One, do we have any sense of what percent of our sales and meals and basically not real estate revenue, not per personal property revenue that's coming, coming from outside the city versus people who live here are spending money here? And are the new developments that are online, the broad in um, Washington, the broad in West, planning to actually happen in the near future? And what will actually be the effect of that bringing revenue from outside the city in? Right. Um, so those are uh, great questions. The, the, when we have a mixed-use project, uh, our mantra, our guiding principle is uh, we want a compelling commercial use in the project. And very often they come in and they, they've got a strong residential component because the market wants that. They know they can sell those. And the commercial is where we spend all of our time trying to expand it and trying to make it more vibrant, more active, more of a draw for people outside the community. And uh, so Harris Teeter is that. Um, the target is that. Uh, we want more of that type of thing that's attracting commerce to the city. It's super competitive. We live in the retail shadow of Tyson's Corner and Clarendon and Pentagon Row, et cetera, et cetera. So we are a community, you know, this is an area that's pretty well served. And so we have to find our niche and try to make sure that, that uh, the developers can understand that and grow it. Um, we have been seeing growth in sales and, and meals taxes. Uh, but we, you know, economic development, a lot of what drives it these, these days is placemaking, is having a, a sense that this is a place where people want to be. It's where they want to hang out, where they uh, want to spend their time. And a lot of our downtown area needs more investment. And that's why the council has made it sort of for several years now. Let's do those things to make it 
um, fire on all cylinders. And for the downtown area, we're not picturing, um, you know, the, the uh, dogwood or Brown's hardware. We're not pr anticipating that that's going to redevelop. For years, we thought it might, but there's so many different property owners there. That's going to remain pretty much the way it is. So let's make it wonderful. And so we're, we're making steps. We're getting grant money to try to spend more money there to make it um, uh, more of a place. The EDA has stepped up with the investment in the downtown plaza. Um, that's, you know, there's a much bigger idea behind those investments than simply, you know, have a nice little park. It's trying to create a, a commercial district that's really going to sing. And Barb Cram in the back has been a great leader in that effort uh, for a long time and has done so much personally to try to do that place making. And she just raised her hand. So, uh, <laughs> is about, um, you know, we've got this big house that we pay taxes on and, and um, there was a, at one point on Little Falls Street, one of the houses wanted to have a rooming house like thing, back in, like after the war, there were houses that they let rooms. Right. Is there any way that we would be able to do that with, with senior home, where homes that are larger could have, you know, or some format where we could take some of these beautiful old homes and use them for multifamily housing. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. there's been some very creative things done in Boston and other places, not that we're Boston, but you know, where people have gathered together to make things work because they wanted to live where their friends were. They don't want to move to some less expensive area, which is way away from all their friends and their work and all that. I, I think that's, uh, I think it's a great idea. And, so on the council work plan is looking at that slightly in a different way than what you descri described, but is allowing accessory, accessory units mm -hmm. on residential lots. Um, so currently, if you wanted to have your basement rented out, you can do that. But if, if you had a carriage house, we don't, it's very hard to get that allowed for, uh, you know, for either for, to rent that out for housing. So that's the policy discussion. Could you have your garage or your carriage house with your property be rented out? And that could be part of an affordable housing um, approach. It does have neighborhood impacts. And so that, you know, we, we know when we change the rules in our residential neighborhoods, we usually fill the room with people who have opinions about it. And so we'll, we'll go through a good process before we evaluate any changes like that. Well, and as I come up to Deborah for the next one, I wonder if you could comment about inside and founders row status, because I think that was yeah, part of I, that I question. Should, I should have. And I'll also note, maybe just in terms of schedule, yeah. we'll try to wrap up here in the next five minutes so that people can get ready for the Women's History March, which is going to start to be convening in the front here very shortly. Um, for, so the status of uh, the founders row project, uh, formerly known as Mason Row, um, they have submitted uh, a special exception amendment to allow the hotel to be changed to age restricted. They've also submitted their site plan, so that's going to be going to the Planning Commission fairly soon. Um, they have uh, wanted to wait until they actually have signed the lease on the movie theater component before they come before the City Council uh, to request the SE amendment on the age restricted versus hotel. Um, but I anticipate that that's going to be coming um, fairly soon. That's kind of driven by their schedule, not the city's, um, but, but I, I think soon. Uh, Washington and Broad, uh, that is scheduled for final council consideration on April 9th. And, um, and if that consideration is favorable, then it would go through uh, a site plan process uh, through the Planning Commission in the, you know, the, the year, in the several months after that. Uh, in terms of fiscal impact of those projects, they're, they're both significantly positive. Um, and so taking our, you know, our past, the Harris Teeter building or the, the Lincoln projects, you know, when those buildings were being built, 80% uh, of our budget growth was coming from new construction. And so um, those were being built at the same time that sequestration was happening. And all of our neighbors, they were really compressing their budgets because uh, you know, our economy was not growing in Northern Virginia. Um, but we were able to keep pretty normal operations because of the new investment that was coming with those projects, and still are. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think is really important when we consider affordable workforce housing is it's 
even more than the diversity of people and how they, what they are earning. Because people that come into this community and currently live here who may not be spending as much on home ownership or rental and are investing in other ways but still need to maintain a certain cost of living are often spending money differently within the city. What I mean by that is just like people who have really high mortgages will often joke that they're house poor. Go take a look at the restaurants and see who's in there and there are financial demographics to back this up. A lot of people are choosing and needing to spend less on a home, but they're spending a tremendous amount day to day in the community and that's a win-win. So it's, although it's important to be helpful and inclusive and to realize that this affects everybody, this is the kind of situation that enables us to be diverse financially as well. Thank you. So we'll take one more question and then I think we'll, we'll, uh, we'll stay here to answer any other questions that you might have. Hi. Um, I think you had a slide, maybe at another presentation, or maybe it's on the website, but just as the schools talked about what they're not funding, yeah. and we've talked about affordable housing or affordable living in the, in the city not being funded, I, I mean, the city's budget only went up 1.7%, so what, what else, I think it would be helpful for us to know what else the city has chosen not to fund on its wish list as well, because I think that's, you know, we're, I am fully support the schools, and I, I'd moved here for the schools, but I also very much want to maintain the, the whole community, the empty nesters, senior citizens, um, you know, all demographics in our city are important to the city. So I think it's important for us to remember what else is the city choosing not to fund by keeping their revenue so or their increase so low as well. Right. That's a good thing to look at. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. In the earlier presentation of the council, there was a slide that now noted there were $4.5 million worth of right. requests that came from our department heads uh, that were not funded in the budget. So those include things like the basics of um, funding to fully fund our repaving and sidewalk repair program, uh, funding for IT replacement so that uh, you know our PC refresh, um, funding for um, our police department. When I talk about our staffing levels, or this have been are four percent lower than they were 15 years ago. Our police department has the same number of FTEs that it did in the 1980s. And our population has increased, I think, by 45% or so since, since that time. Um, so there are, that, that's just a, a, a few of those. We'll be discussing those with the council. Um, I do think that the budget, um, as presented, is one that is sustainable. I think we're, we're going to be able to maintain services with it. But uh, there are consequences and implications. Our, our budget grew by under 1% last year as well. So we, we've been trying to keep them pretty flat for multiple years in a row. Thank you all again for coming out on a beautiful Sunday and I hope you all will join us for the march that's the, or the walk that's coming up in just a moment. Uh, Dr. Noonan, any last words? Just thanks for coming. Have a nice okay. walk. It's a beautiful day. Thank you.